Kia ora, good evening. Police and fire service investigators have been working today to establish the cause of a fire that gutted a building at the East Gore Primary School last night. Police and fire staff attended the blaze at the school in the Wentworth Street after being alerted by a passing member of the public shortly before 8pm last night. Police say it's too early in the investigations to say whether the fire is suspicious or not. The building, which was destroyed in the fire, was used by the school as a storage and wet weather facility. Police are keen, keen to hear from anyone who might have information that could assist the investigation. Police with information can contact Gore Police Direct or phone in information anonymously by calling Crime Stoppers on 0800 555 111. From midnight, the sale and possession of the 41 legal hire products previously approved for distribution will be illegal following the passage of the Psychoactive Substances Amendment Act. The amendment removes all remaining psychoactive products on the market. It also bans the use of animal testing data in support of product approvals. The region's sole remaining retail outlet for legal highs was doing a brisk trade today, but authorities are advising those in possession of the soon-to-be illegal products to return them to the retailer they purchased them from. Health Minister Tony Ryle says the amendment means all interim retail and wholesale licences will be cancelled and all psychoactive products given interim approval will be removed from sale. The minister says that while animal testing remains a necessary and important component of the process for developing a number of important products such as medicines, the government does not believe that such testing was justifiable for the recreational drug market. Feline fur may fly when a local cat owner is charged for exceeding the allowable number of cats in Invercargill. Charges against a cat owner will be heard in the district court on May 20th, following attempts by Invercargill City Council staff, SPCA and friends to remove at least 34 of her 37 cats. Charges relate to the Health Act of 1956 and the keeping of animals, poultry and bees bylaw, which allows residents to have no more than three cats. The owner faces fines of up to $500 and $50 a day while the offence continues. The Thurzo Street resident has refused to give up her pussies and recently began to keep the cats indoors. Speaking today at the National Grey Power AGM in Invercargill was Minister for Senior Citizens, Joe Goodhue. Ms Goodhue praised Grey Power for its commitment to lobby and speak up for its members. Hunter Andrews asked the Minister about her address and what key policies National has to attract or retain the senior vote this coming election. The key points for, for me to address this um, crowd from Grey Power, because they're really good lobbyists for their people, is to tell them what I think has been going particularly well and to encourage them to keep in touch with us, the government. So during the period between 1st of April 2008 until the 1st of April this year, their superannuation has gone up 28%. Granted, during that time there's been a 15% increase in inflation as well. But what I'm saying is we're out there spending their money, their taxpayer money, very, very carefully. And I'll be giving them some, ex some examples of the ways we're actually spending that money. Roy Reid, of course, the president of Grey Power New Zealand, raised a few points, key issues he thought. Well, firstly, elective surgery mm -hmm. and the fact that he sees it as a, a non-uniformity in the way DHBs prioritise people. And he was calling, or Grey Power are, for some sort of uniform system throughout the country. Well, there actually is a uniform system, but when you put people into the mix that are actually assessing the priority of the patients, you're always going to get a sense that that things are maybe different one place to another. You're also going to get a sense that um, maybe you weren't at the interview between the surgeon and the patient and, and so for whatever reason that person actually scored more highly and got the priority and got onto a surgical list. So I just encourage people to make sure their GP and their surgeon knows exactly what they're dealing with. Don't undersell the amount of pain you're on you're actually in and because people can be quite stoic and sometimes I think it actually does actually help them get the right outcomes but across the country the populations in each DHB they are different some DHBs have more older people the population funding to the DHB is adjusted a bit for that but we also find I mean you know there's all sorts of factors that actually impact on the service provision in each DHB we now publish each quarter how the DHB is going against its elective surgery targets and we know that across the country there are now 4,000 more elective surgeries every year, year on year since we came into government. 
that's down to really good management, efficiency and effectiveness within the DHBs. They're doing a grand job but we need them to keep increasing that rate because we do have more people needing, requiring elective surgery. If there was a key policy that the current national government has that you would be pushing to get that grey vote, what is it? What, what do you want people thinking in September as they're walking into that polling booth, I'm giving my vote to national? I would like them to think about how we've managed through a very difficult financial time. During the global financial crisis, the aftermath of the Christchurch earthquakes, I'd like them to ask themselves whether they think we've been efficient economic managers of the taxpayer money that they give us to manage. And I'd like them to look at our record, improving the numbers of elective surgeries, actually getting the lowest crime rate in 30 years, 600 more police on the streets, education improvements across the board for Māori Pacific and other New Zealanders, and the targets we've actually set for ourselves to make things even better in reducing crime, reducing re-victimisation. The sort of things they tell us are really important to them. So I'd ask them to look at our record and see whether they believe we are the best economic stewards of their taxpayer dollar. The lineup for this year's Bluff Oyster and Seafood Festival is confirmed, but there's little change to the format for the event. Ticket sales for the event, that's just over a fortnight away, are ahead of last year, according to organisers who say the historic Wearable Arts Creativity Awards will again be a feature, along with oyster eating and opening competitions. Kiwi songstress Anika Moa is the headlined act, supported by all girl band The Johnnies and local lineup Lipstick. Plenty of iconic bluff oysters will be available on the day, as well as other fare from stall holders. Bluff's main street will also be lined with community stalls for the day. Southland is not to be denied Super 15 level rugby this season, with the Highlanders taking on the New Zealand Barbarians at Rugby Park Stadium on Friday the 20th of June. The Highlanders will use the game as preparation for their final three round robin games of the 2014 Super Rugby competition. The Barbarians will be coached by Stags coach Brad Moore and managed by Lester Rutledge. The side's expected to have an international component as well as a number of promising Stags and players from other New Zealand provinces. Stay with us, still to come on the bulletin, Winston Peters is in the south and we caught up with him at the Grey Powers AGM. Welcome back. Renewed consumer confidence is paying off for the car market with vehicle sales soaring in April. New and used vehicle import sales for April were up 70% on the same time last year, making it the best April in nine years. Used import vehicle sales led the charge with a 23% increase. For the year to date, total vehicle sales are up 22% compared to last year, with used import vehicle sales 31% ahead of 2013. Toyota was the market leader for new passenger cars in April, followed closely by Holden and Hyundai. Also in the city today for the Grey Power AGM was New Zealand First Leader Winston Peters, who used his address as an opportunity to attack the policies of the current government. Amongst other things, Mr Peters raised immigration, foreign property investment and retirement savings. Hunter Andrews asked the former Deputy Prime Minister why Southlanders should consider voting New Zealand First. Well, we've got an economic plan which decisively helps this province, helps the exporters, uh, ensures that the money that they create stays in the south and rather than goes to some other economy and some other foreign pockets. You can see what's happening to the dollar now. Each cent that rises against US is a cent or percentage not coming to the southern economy. So southern needs an economy for provincial and rural people and it's not happening now. What would you do to that dollar value? Well, I, well the dollar is massively overinflated and that overinflation helps the commercial sector the financial services and the paper shuffles of Queen Street, Auckland. Now it's not in the interests of Southland people and the Southland province to allow that to happen, but that's what their representatives in, par in Parliament are doing. And so I think it's wake up time here, because when the dollar gets to 90 cents, what are you going to say then? For the average dairy farm here, it's probably a loss of 140,000 plus every year. 140,000 plus every year is money that should be in the Southland province and coming towards the uh, consumer market of uh, Invercargill. Are those innegotiable in any sort of coalition talks, regional development, the dollar value, the retirement age, compulsory savings? Uh, they're not negotiable, no. We're not going to be interested in being alongside any government that sells out the 
uh, character and nature of New Zealand's economy in favour of foreign interests. In short, we want to look after our farmers, our businessmen, our exporters, not just foreign banks and foreign insurance companies and paper shufflers. So that's not negotiable. Let's move to Auckland because we all talk about Auckland New Zealand and it's a nice place to visit, but some of us prefer to live in South and what incentives to get people to move to the regions, if any? Well, that's a great question. You're asking that question because there's no policy at the moment that assists the provinces, whether it be the West Coast, whether it be you know, Mid-Canterbury, South Canterbury, whether it be Gisborne or you know, Whanganui. None of these places are getting any support at all because the economy is run for the downtown paper shelters of Queen Street, Auckland. The banks are making massive profits. They're all making huge returns, higher than anywhere else in the world. Meanwhile, your politicians down here are saying they can't do a thing. So you want to know what our plan is? We're going to change the Reserve Bank Act to affect and support the provincial economies of New Zealand, the exporters who bring the wealth of this country, and then we're going to ensure that as much of our raw product is processed and added value here rather than go off to some foreign economy for billions of dollars of wealth for them and hundreds of thousands of dollars for them. Why is, for example, timber our third biggest export commodity going out in its most raw state with so few jobs? Let's talk again about Auckland. We look at rents up there. People are paying enormous rents on minimum wage. They get rent subsidies. In effect, the rest of the country is subsidising people to live in Auckland. Well, you're right. You're, you're subsidising a lot of foreign landowners, a lot of foreign landlords. That's what's happening in Auckland, at the middle and upper end. Uh, these people have come in, in some cases, just bought countless, tens and tens and tens of homes. One guy, 77. That is a foreigner from offshore China. 77 homes in Auckland. Now he's the landlord, and you're subsidising the rents. How does that work? Well, it doesn't, but there's one party that said that for a long time, and that party's New Zealand first. Is the answer a capital gains tax, do you think, partially? No, the capital gains tax won't stop that happening. That's not the answer at all. The Skyrocketing answer, housing prices. No, no, the answer is, first of all, get that sort of foreign influence, using, usually money laundered money, using money laundered money out of the market. That's the number one thing. And bring the market to its senses so that things level out, because nobody in the provinces, unless they've got a really wealthy grandfather or uncle or parent, can afford to move any more and shift to Auckland. They can't afford the housing. What sort of showing will New Zealand First or emphasis and resources will go into winning the, uh, winning the Invercargill seat, trying to win it? We're going to pull the stops out everywhere to get our share of the vote. And we feel pretty confident that things are on the rise for us. <laughs> you recall the last election, we were shut out and marginalised everywhere, no coverage whatsoever. And we came to Invercargill uh, to leak the Tea Party <laughs> tapes at the Invercargill Working Men's Club, and it was a devastating, effective meeting for us. But we knew we had support here then, and as a consequence, we came in very, very strong. But this time, we are far better uh, organised. Uh, we've got a good platform of MPs, and we are campaigning in every part of the country, particularly areas like Southland, where surely people understand there's something dramatically going wrong. Export, wealthiest province in the country per capita. 3% of the population, about 80-90% of the exports. Why are we in the bottom half of the incomes of this country? Now, that one fact alone tells you that whoever you've been voting for is wasting your time. And that's all from us this Wednesday. Sports along next from the news team. Good night.